Hello, everyone, and welcome to our eighth presentation of the Power of Population Data Science webinar series. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Karina Jones, who will be presenting on the good, the bad, and the clunky, improving the use of administrative data for research. By way of introduction, Dr. Karina Jones is an associate professor of the Health Informatics at Swansea University, where she is the academic lead for information governance and public engagement to ensure data protection and maximize socially acceptable data utility across various Swansea University-based data-intensive linkage initiatives, including SAIL Data Bank, Administrative Data Research Centre in Wales, the FAR, and recently awarded the HDRUC collaboration between Swansea University and Queen's University in Belfast. Karina leads the Active Innovation Governance Working Group at the FAR Institute, which works collaboratively to advise and influence the developing data governance landscape to promote the safe use and reuse of data. She leads an IG research program, including work to inform cross-center research and how emerging data types, such as genetic data, can be used in conjunction with health record data. Thanks, everyone, for joining us, and I'll pass it over to Karina. Thank you very much, Anne. Hi, welcome everyone who's listening live and hello to those who will be listening in the future as a voice from the past. Um, so yes, I'm going to be speaking to you about a study that I, I conducted on uh, advancing the use of administrative data, recognising that there are challenges and I always like to go for a quirky title. So I went for the good, the bad and the clunky and also because uh, we now have the findings, we have the outcomes as well. So what I'll do just briefly is I'll give you an outline of what it is I'm going to include in this webinar. Background to the Administrative Data Research Network, the ADRN, which was set up in the UK. Um, I'll tell you a little about its structure, its operations and the sorts of research it's been involved in. And then I'll describe the good, the bad and the clunky as the study and put that into context and look at future work. So really then, the ADRN opened up new possibilities for using administrative data in the UK. A lot of work, as we all know, has been done on health data, but not as much on the wider administrative data that comes from organisations such as government departments, local authorities, education establishments, social housing, such like. And there are particular challenges. Some of them, of course, are in common with health data, but um, there are some particular challenges. And of course, health data is not excluded from administrative data, but it, it's incorporated as one element of administrative data. That sort of data really that's collected as part of the delivery of um, public services. So we could see there were considerable challenges, but also scope for further improvements and gains. So in terms of background to the ADRN, the Economic and Social Research Council commissioned an administrative data task force. I believe that was in 2010, 2011. And then they did a lot of work on looking at what could be done and what was needed. And they produced this report in 2012. Um, it, it, the task force recognised the great opportunities for research using de-identified administrative data and that if these data could be made available in ways that pre prevent the re-identification, it would open up a much wider research agenda than was currently in place. It was seen as being able to generate efficiency gains in terms of high costs of alternative research sources and the speed in which findings could be produced. So the report recommended that there should be an administrative data research network. Um, that meant there would be one ADRC, that C stands for Centre, in each of the UK jurisdictions. So one in each of Wales, Scotland, England and Northern Ireland. And that these should be really well equipped. They should be state of the art facilities for research using de-identified data. They should be able to link data from government departments and then make that available for research in safe environments and have a programme of conducting original research. 
And the ADRN was established in 2013. And as well as the centres in each of the administrative and each of the jurisdictions, there was also an AD service, so an administrative data service. And that was uh, that had a coordinating role. So it centralised things like communications. Um, it, it dealt with things like branding, websites, and also a central training role. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in terms of how these ADRCs operate, each one operates a data repository model. So each one brings together data into a repository and then makes the data available in safe settings. I'll use the Sale Data Bank as an example from ADRC Wales because it's the one I understand best, as you can imagine from my accent. Um, and ADRC Wales is then built on the established work of the Sale Data Bank, which began primarily as a data, a data bank of the identified health records, but then expanded into including the wider administrative data, such as education, housing, uh, social care, and some government department data as well. And Sale has a suite of technical, physical, and procedural controls around the data as well as applying control measures to the data. So we see the environment as being particularly important, not just the controls you could apply to data, uh, the data set itself. But when the ESRC set this up, they, they uh, deemed that there may be a need for something additional, whereas what we generally do is we allow um, researchers to access the data in a virtual secure environment, but from their own desktops, so it could be anywhere. The ESRC decided that there needed to be one additional step, which was to have a safe room or a safe pod. And this is the little picture of a safe pod here, which is a standalone uh, room that can be installed in any place, such as in a university, um, but that isn't one of the administrative data research centres. And I think it may be something characteristic of the British, really, that there's been some public engagement work that has found that people are in some ways a little more reticent about information about themselves being shared on salaries and pensions and benefits than they are about their health data. I mean, obviously, the data still need to be handled properly and in a de-identified form, but it's quite a classic British trait that we don't talk about money. So that may have been one of the reasons why uh, there was this additional step seen as being a good safeguard. And as I mentioned, the ADRCs are involved in all sorts of areas of research and the data, when the data are available on remote access, can be used by anyone around the world, as with the Sale Data Bank. And there are lots and lots of studies on the website with the link there. I think there are 106 on there at the moment on all these sorts of different areas. They've been broken up into these different areas so you can see how the work is progressing. Now, I must note, and I will explain a little more about this a bit later on, that the ADRN ran from 2013 to 2018, and then there was a reorganisation and a reforming into the ADR partnership. So the website that I'm showing you here was archived in July 2018. So some of the work you see in there may be further ahead than is shown on that website. But it gives an ex uh, a range of examples of the sort of research that has been going on with the administrative data. So coming to the study then, the good, the bad, and the cluggy. Um, the rationale for the study was that um, having been involved in the, in the ADRN for four years, so by 2017, I was looking around and seeing, well, look at all this really good stuff that's being done, but also I could see that there was scope for improvement because um, I was, I, I've been the Associate Director for Data and Methods in Administrative Data Research Centre Wales. And so I was looking at, well, how are we doing things and how are things working? And also looking out at places like Canada and Australia and other countries where there's more work perhaps with administrative data. And 
I could see there was also, apart from these challenges, there was an appetite to move forward. How can we use what has been learned and what can we improve from that? So the study came about really in order to try and uh, explore good practice, look at the barriers and the bottlenecks in the effective use of administrative data. And then this is where the good, the bad and the clunky comes in. How can we share the good? How can we solve the bad? And how can we improve the clunky issues to lead to improvements? And it was done as a case study of the ADRN because it had been operating for four years. It had broken new ground in the UK at least. And it meant that I had access to quite a number of staff members in the different centres that I could work with to find out about their experiences. So that was the rationale really. But the findings are applicable more widely in the use of administrative data in general. In terms of study design, um, it's important I point out that the study design focuses on data use. So it doesn't look at everything in the work of the ADRCs. I mean, it doesn't include technical developments. It doesn't include public engagement specifically, but it looks at data use and how do we manage data use from start to finish, really. It was run as a qualitative online survey among the staff, the free text response format, and that ran, that was open for three weeks. And that was something that the central, uh, the ADS uh, uh, distributed for me. And then the findings were reviewed and themed and summarised by consensus of three researchers. And then we had a large workshop with 95 people, actually, to discuss the summarised findings and then make further suggestions of how can we go forward and develop recommendations from that. So this is how the survey was set up so that you can see how it was focusing on data use. So thinking about repository models and trying to think through what happens, it's what it's trying to do is capture what needs to happen from identifying data sets all the way through to data archiving, which, of course, may not apply with other models, as I mentioned, you know, mentioned there may be uh, other organisations which run in different ways, which may have federated models where this may not apply. But this applies to repositories. So beginning with identifying data sets, how do we know what's out there? Acquiring data sets, how do we work with data providers um, in order to be able to bring in data in an appropriate way? How do we work with data providers in getting permissions and their due diligence processes? How do we manage regulatory approvals, the need for ethics approval if it's needed, or other approvals? Peer review approvals to do a scientific review of proposed studies looking at whether consent is needed to link data, what sort of consent, how were the data accessed, what disclosure measures need to be put in place before data access can take place, and then what about data formats, how do we deal with those, and data quality, linkage quality, metadata, so we know basically about the data, and then support available to researchers. Now, with the ADRN, there is a system of research support officers, which are funded by the centres, and they are there to help researchers, dedicated resources to help researchers uh, through the research process. How do people acquire analysis skills, availability tools, disclosure in what can be released, what are the requirements around reuse of data and retention and archiving? I mean, this isn't uh, in perfect order, you know, because you need to consider certain things like data quality at different stages, but it just shows you really what the survey was trying to find out in a, in a rough order from identifying data sets to archiving. And so this was designed in a way to ask people for each of those areas. So how would you, let's say, for number seven there on accessing data, how would you identify what, what is good practice? What have you observed that's good practice? And how could we share that? What can you see that's a barrier that's really not working? And how can we overcome that? And what's working maybe a little bit, not working too well and creating bottlenecks? And how could we improve that? So for each of those 18 topics, people were asked 
these three things. What's good, what's bad, what's clunky, and how can we deal with that? And the information was provided as free text responses, which, as you can imagine, generated a lot of information, but we felt that that would give us richer, a richer data set to analyse than if we had um, asked questions, let's say, on a Likert scale. We'd really be able to drill down into what people were thinking. And we had 27 respondents from across the ADRN. And people weren't asked for their name, it was just their job role, because we weren't, we wanted people to feel they could say everything they wanted to say, um, but not necessarily to need to provide their name. So the job roles included people from management, the research support officers, academics, researchers, uh, staff involved in teaching, public engagement, office administration, all sorts of people. And... Um, that was how we did that. And then we grouped the information into themes. So the themes were then what was taken forward into the workshop. And they roughly based on those 18 points with a slight, uh, there's a slight modification on one of the areas. So we have data acquisition pathway. And if we just peep back up for a second, so the first three points, data acquisition pathway, identifying data sets, acquiring data sets, and obtaining data provided permissions, and so on with the others. The only slight change of order was on putting together the controls of disclosure controls on access and that release of results into the same category because they were quite similar. Now, there's a little star next to the top one and the bottom one because the ADRN already had a work stream going on in each of those areas. There was already someone leading a work stream on how to improve data acquisition and similarly on data reuse and retention as well. So we wanted to acknowledge that and not try and reinvent a wheel that was already becoming nicely round. So when we came to the workshop, what we did was... We looked at how to distribute the summaries from the, from the survey so that they could be discussed by group. So the way I did that was, because we had 95 people, which was a huge workshop, they were split up into tables of approximately 10 people. And so then each of these topics here were randomly assigned to two tables except for the top one and the bottom one, which were purposefully given to the table where the lead person of that work stream was sitting, so that they would be able to add their insights and take the, take the work forward rather than just completely new people discussing something and maybe coming up with work that had already been done. So the idea was to ask people to look at the summary of the survey findings and to look at what they could make most headway with. I'm always reluctant to ask people to spend too long on barriers, and we'd already done that in the survey. So the purpose of the workshop was to see, well, what can we make headway with? So two questions, really. Internally to the network, what can we do practically? And then on the outside, who do we need to influence? What do we need to do in order to <coughs> take these findings forward? So what I'll do now is I'll tell you how the results turned out. So those are now the, the results I'm going to show you are the ones that came from the survey and came from the workshop and will then put together to um, create what's good, what's bad, what's clunky, what can we recommend and what actions can we propose. So all bringing everything together. So starting off here with the data acquisition pathway. And before I introduce these, it's worth me pointing out that because of the differences in how different centres operate, although they're on a repository model, there'll still be differences in how they're set up and how they work. We'll probably see that a point that's perhaps uh, mentioned as a good thing may also be mentioned in a slightly different way as a clunky thing, because it may have been good in one place and not so good in another place. But I think that's that's just you know the nature of, of a network, really, rather than one individual centre. So what was good in terms of the data acquisition pathway? Well, it was having knowledgeable research support officers. 
good relationships with data providers and streamlined processes for data acquisition. In terms of what was bad, there was difficulty in identifying a data custodian, which, as you can imagine, obviously is, is a challenge when you're trying to work out what data are available and who do you need to talk to. If it's not clear who the data custodian is, then that's a difficulty. Lack of information on progress. If you're negotiating with an organisation about a data set to come into a repository, but there's no actual marker of where are we are in, in the stages. And some processes being inconsistent between organisations as well. What was clunky? Um, lack of complete data set documentation uncertainty about decision makers and differing interpretations in legislation and regulations, which is a common, a common issue, whatever sort of data we're dealing with. Recommendations from that were to have a regularly updated and well signposted information resource on data sets, identifying the data custodian and providing metadata. More streamlined data acquisition process, the progress tracker and a standardised process for data provider permissions, greater clarity in who the decision makers are, and agreed target timelines. Suggested actions for this are to increase dialogue between the centres, the providers and the researchers. That's a common theme is, is, what, that was coming out, is to increase dialogue. To place the focus on themes rather than on individual government departments. And what that means is, what came out was that um, rather than go to individual government departments and talk about the data that could be useful, is uh, the ADRN initiated a series of themes. So let's say housing or ageing and older people, and then to discuss those areas with the government departments so they could see what a more tangible idea of what could be done with the data. Um, another action was to adopt the principles of the Digital Economy Act. Now, this is something that really only applies in the UK. And what that does is it extends the opportunities for data sharing by government departments because it provides for, it allows the identification by a trusted third party. And implementing the, um, the five Ps, that was a framework that was put together by uh, the data acquisition lead. And that stands for personality, about demonstrating trustworthiness, prospectus, being clear about who we are, what we do, a clearer pathway for data acquisition, working in partnership, planning out the service and what's been provided, and being clearer about what the project is that's going to be produced from the research. In terms of approval processes, what was good was it was felt that the main regulatory and peer approval processes were seen to be working well. Um, the need to address these issues with providers at the early, earliest stage. What was bad? Again, diverse interpretations of legislation and regulations, duplication and over-reliance on participant consent. There is a, a kind of a idea floating around that consent is the ultimate panacea really and that if you've got consent oh it's almost as if it's a catch-all we have consent therefore we can do these things but sometimes consent isn't the best route sometimes consent needs to be specific for the area it's dealing with or in some areas it needs it, it can be broad consent sometimes it's not possible to be totally specific so I think that the, what came out was that there's a lack of clarity really on what is needed in consent in different in different areas and whether it's needed at all times, uh, depending how the data are managed. Um, what was clunky? Approval processes weren't transparent to researchers. They didn't really feel they knew what was going on. Uncertainty when the data custodian approval was required and over-concern about disclosure risks due to record linkage. In some ways, could be thought of as a lack of understanding of how the systems operate, that just because the data are linked doesn't mean they're actually going anywhere. And what could be recommended? Um, well, greater transparency and consistent advice to researchers. That peer review should be proportionate 
one size doesn't necessarily fit all. It, it may need to depend on what the proposal is looking to address and which stakeholders need to be involved, rather than everyone needs to approve everything really. It needs to be clear information on where consent to link is and is not needed. The suggested actions were to streamline those processes, allow researchers a greater insight, allowing them to attend where possible, and for researchers to document and share experiences of going through the approval processes so that they could say, well, this worked for me, that didn't work for me, and have a little, almost like a crib sheet of, ah, do's and don'ts, try this, don't try that, because it, it really was a challenge. And also provide case studies to illustrate consent requirements so that when researchers are putting proposals together, they can look at um, what is actually needed for this particular study that's like my study. For controls on access and disclosure, what was felt to be good was the flexibility of the safe settings for data access and working towards common principles for statistical disclosure control. What was bad? Um, approvals being just by jurisdiction are not possible across boundaries, too few safe rooms and safe pods, and a lack of transparency about the control measures that have been applied to data when it's viewed by the researcher. You know, researchers felt they didn't know whether certain variables or certain records had been suppressed and what the influence of that would be on their findings. Clunky having to travel to safe rooms and safe pods and sometimes difficult control was seen as a bit over restrictive. Another thing was maybe data providers or regulators not grasping that just because something's unique doesn't mean it's identifiable. It's all about controls that are applied um, around to the data and around the data. What can be done? We recommended that approval, approvals should be able to include cross-national studies and there should be greater use of the safe settings. Greater clarity on what is meant by disclosure risk and more transparency on the measures applied. And harmonise training for those who check the results because there'll be people who scrutinise information before it's before findings or tables or coefficients can be released. There needs to be that checking for who checks the results before they're released. The suggested actions again were the implementation of the five or six P's plan and a set of flexible principles to allow researchers to self-check their proposed outputs so that would educate them but also minimise the work for the checkers and common training as well. The data and metadata, this was um, something again that there was some good, bad and clunky and what was good was seen to be compatible and standard data formats, good metadata, and quality reports on uh, data linkage. What was bad was when the data doesn't match the data dictionaries or they're out of date, or metadata is limited or it's not provided, and again, lack of information on linkage quality. On Clunky, there was a lack of clarity in who should solve data formatting issues. Is it the data provider or is it done at the centre by the analysts. And there was insufficient feedback to data providers on data quality. In terms of recommendation, there's a need for standardised documentation and versioning, a need for more communication again with data providers to share data quality reports, and standardised data linkage quality reports. There's a need for greater consistency between metadata and data set content through that increased dialogue and the creation of a standardised metadata catalogue. As an action, there's always the same action, <laughs> increased dialogue, document and share solutions, but also to create a persisted asset linking and citation index for data sets. So this would be something like a DOI number, which follows the data set and can be used to track how often a data set is used and shared, which can also be used for brownie points, basically, for the person who's created the data set. Often, um, researchers may feel that they've put an awful lot of work into creating a data set or analysts similarly, but if there are actual um, value placed on the data sharing, then 
that would be more of an incentive really for people <clears throat> to do that. In terms of research, in terms of research support, what was good was when the research support officers were not tied up with administration work and that there's a variety of training courses and analysis tools. But in BAD, there was a lack of data analysis and manipulation skills among researchers and that not coming to light early enough so that the research support officers didn't feel that they were equipped to provide the support needed because it wasn't clear that the researchers didn't have the skills that perhaps it appeared they had until it was a bit too late. For Clunky, there was some inconsistency in support across the network because obviously they're autonomous centres and sometimes in accessing specialist software. In addressing that, the recommendations were to make that support more consistent by more networking and throughout the project lifecycle, more training for researchers on data manipulation and making sure tools and software are up to date. The way to address this would be to clarify expectations and clear a documentation of what the researcher support staff roles are. What can they do and what shouldn't they be doing? What should researchers be doing themselves? What should be picked up by administration staff? But also to increase connection with outside networks for mutual support, which also obviously would be places like you know, linking the ADRN with the IPDLN. And with um, we've got, in the UK, we have an anonymization network where there are skills to be learned there and other similar networks. Um, another suggested action was to help funders understand that when you're working with data intensive research, there needs to be some, some more time and flexibility to allow for unknown delays in accessing data. And the final area is about data reuse and retention. Now, when the um, ADRN was set up, the the model that was chosen at the time for political reasons really was a create and destroy model. Now that was done um, particularly for the new administrative data coming in, that uh, the idea was that once the project is completed, the data were not retained and archived, but they were actually destroyed. Now that was seen as the best thing at the time, but um, there's a move now towards, and in fact, it has been implemented, that the, the centres have data reuse and retention for the administrative data. For the centres that were already established, this was never really going to be practical, as you can imagine. For the Sale Data Bank, where we do have data reuse and retention, it would have been incredibly complex for us to try and, and actually implement that. So in terms of what was good for data reuse and retention, was about clustering the projects into themes, as I mentioned earlier, because that would save on extraction time for data providers, allowing that data to be reused. Otherwise, a project is completed and the data are deleted, and then something similar, uh, someone went through something similar, they'd have to go through the whole process again. The create and destroy model was seen as a waste of resources and too short a period before the data had to be deleted. And what was clunky was the need for data provider permission before data use and researchers wanting to keep data for their own exclusive use. What we can do about that and what has been done is projects being clustered into themes and all data being now reusable within a data safe haven and clearly defined stewardship of that retained data with the asset um, registration number. Further actions, encourage data reuse, require good reasons before supporting a project unwilling to allow data reuse. Build transparency into the models, including the level of control data providers wish to retain. And build awareness among data providers of the value and also the loss of benefits that take place due to a create and destroy model. So the summary in terms of the ADRN, which, as I mentioned, um, has turned into the ADRP. Um, a report was produced, which was focused in particularly for the ADRN. Um, the action plan was very well received, recognising the work already underway, as I mentioned, in the two areas of data acquisition and retention and reuse.
And then the at the end of, no, it wasn't at the end, I think it was around the beginning of 2018, the ASRC decided they wanted to do a bit of a reorganisation. It wasn't as a result of this study, I must, must mention, but this study is informing the new development of the partnership, which is now in place and has been in place since the autumn. So there are still ADRCs in Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland, but in England there's been a change so that uh, there is now a, a much larger role, a major role for the Office of National Statistics. And the reasons for that were probably many, but among them were those ongoing difficulties in working with different government departments, differences in legislation and due diligence processes. But in terms of summary in general, um, what we can conclude really is that government departments need to see a clear programme of work. They need to see the potential benefits on a wider scale rather than just approaching them and asking if they're happy to share their data. They really need to be able to see, well, what are the benefits of this? They need to see compelling arguments for the potential outcomes, return on investment being not money in, in, in that sense, but if they're putting in effort in order to provide data, they need to be able to see, well, what is the feedback on this for my department in informing how the department is run and in providing information for citizens and society? Approvals processes need to be robust and proportionate to protect data providers and citizens, but also not to be a hindrance to research, because it's ever so easy to go for a sledgehammer approach, but that would then be a hindrance to research. There needs to be that proportionate approach there. There need to be standardised approval processes with equivalence to minimise the duplication of effort, particularly when you're working across a partnership and for other sorts of cross-centre working. It, it can be quite a challenge when a researcher may need to go through lots of different uh, approval processes with all their different requirements. Um, it needs to be standardised training for researchers, consistent metadata, common control measures. So that would promote then compatibility and comparative research. The reuse of data needs to be properly governed with trustworthy uh, data stewardship and that ongoing need for good communication with all stakeholders. In terms of future work, um, the study was limited to the staff. And there's much work needing to be done with data providers and regulators to look at their needs, their concerns, and how to overcome the challenges in data provision to make it work for everyone. There needs to be an expanded programme of public engagement. The use of administrative data, although it's progressing, is still quite novel, especially thinking about other sorts of data that could be, could be linked to administrative data, different data formats, such as um, free text data or genomic data. It may be quite difficult to see the link between genomic data and housing data, let's say. But if you think about health data and housing data and genomic data, then you've got the individual and their health issues in their environment and lifestyle factors and such like. There's a lot of work needed on the legal and ethical issues. Um, there are still difficulties there, particular legislation is in place, some isn't in place, such that some data at the moment, at least in the UK, can't be shared and there need to be solutions for that and how to approach that. And really then there needs to be these optimum models for how do we work in partnership and how to work within and across the centres. As well as presenting the benefits to researchers and to data providers and regulators, we also need to remember to present the fuller picture of what happens if we don't do this, that um, it's easy enough to see with health data that benefits are not accrued and harms occur, but there could also be a study that looks at well, what happens if we don't use administrative data, what happens in terms of housing provision, what happens in terms of education, what happens in terms of uh, benefits, let's say, and working out uh, with hard to reach groups or who who needs certain help and who doesn't. Um, there's a lot to be done there. And it's not just about 
well if things are not done, benefits are not gained. From what I've seen with health data, if things are not done, it's not just the benefits that are not gained, but harms uh, occur in their place. Just to finish off then, this is the article. It's available uh, there on that link. So the good, the bad and the clunky, improving the use of administrative data for research. Thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions, then please ask. And if you're listening later than this is on live, then you're welcome to email me. One thing you talked about was um the value of, of data sharing and reuse of data and uh, sort of encouraging researchers to think that way and potentially uh, providing some level of a, a bonus. You mentioned brownie points for, for people who are, who are willing to do that. Can you think of how that reward would, what would that reward look like? Well, it is something that most of the funders, at least in the UK, are very keen on data reuse now. So our funding councils have in their policies that they want to see data reused. But I think that something that they don't actually do is recognise the work and the effort that goes into that. So it could be that in terms of when people put in their grants, that they uh, they receive some resource from the funding council or the, the research charity or whatever it is in order to help them uh, make the data reusable, either by depositing the data in a, a research repository or if they're already working there, just to maybe prepare data that could be useful to other people. Um, another thing is what, what I, I generally see is that Researchers and academics, it's, it's largely about papers and grants, you know, those are the things we're measured on. But the people, the other people, such as data managers and analysts, may not be managed in that way because they may not be their targets. But if there was this persisted asset number, um, that would enable the, the tracking of how often um, data are shared, which could perhaps be recognised in performance indicators. Um, let's say I've, I've been an analyst on this, creating this big cohort, and my cohort has been shared or reused by this number of other people as well. Obviously, that works for researchers as well, you know, the, the asset number. But it could be, I think, those sorts of things to to recognise it. There also needs to be a change in terms of how academic establishments see um, see that rather than just saying, OK, you've published five papers and you've got three grants in the last four years or whatever it is. But to be able to say, OK, we're going to place a value on this work you're doing now in creating the data and enable it to be used by other people. So those, I think, are the sorts of things I would think could be. That sounds excellent, and it really does support uh, champion behavior, doesn't it, in terms of uh, mm. leadership and things. Um, yeah. had another question. You mentioned a training for researchers uh, just in terms of their ability to effectively check outputs or uh, mm. data quality issues, etc. Are you doing that in the UK, or is it something that you're working on still? Oh, it's something that we're working on. The ADRN, as it was the network, was going to be implementing training on that. But since the reorganisation, that hasn't quite got started yet. But um, it is something we do locally within SAIL is we encourage people to question themselves in terms of what they want to release because we don't allow um, row level data to be released. So when someone has carried out their analysis and let's say they've produced some charts or they've produced some tables, we've got some guidelines that say to them, OK, you need to check that you're not asking for, let's say, uh, small numbers of records below five or whatever it is um, to be released before it actually goes to the person who acts as the, the official checker. So that cuts down on it makes them think as well about disclosure. You know, it makes them think about the risk that could be introduced in releasing. Uh, records, small geographies, for example, and need to think about that sort of thing. And then it goes to the checker, who then has the second look, really, to make sure that it is all, or has all been done properly. That sounds that sounds excellent. Um, and what about you mentioned comments about uh, a theme? So discussing um, mm. themes of, of data that would be used with government as opposed to just addressing uh, a data request through an individual department. How do you uh, imagine that would occur? Or are you already doing that? Yes, that that's already taking place. There are a number of themes. Um, 
we have within our ADRC, we have uh, six strategic impact programs, and I can't quote you all of them, but one is mental health, one is children, one is housing. There are three more, but I'll just I'll just give you those. I, I could dig them out. Um, and so then what we're doing is theming our research into those areas so that um, each of those will have a structure where there will be a lead academic and then there will be an Im impact officer, analysts, so that when there's engagement with government departments, they can understand that it's feeding into this theme of research and the government departments can feed into what they're, what they're looking for from it so that it feeds back to them when the findings come and it's actually uh, works both ways then. So useful research is found that also informs policy. Okay, that, that sounds great too. Um, just wondering about the, the safe pods that you mentioned mm. um, for particularly sensitive data you mentioned, potentially, I guess, financial data and others. Do, do you see that continuing or is that something that you would hope through, um, you know, further education or assurance of data uh, security and quality that that would change or how do you see those safe mm. pods you, being used in the yes. future? Yeah, I suppose I'd like to see the vast majority of data being able to be used just in the safe setting. So the, the virtual setting and, and remote access as we do for, you know, most of the data. But I'm not sure whether the, there's a readiness to abandon them as yet, particularly because there's still a lot of negotiation going on with different government departments. When you think of things like the Ministry of Justice or um, Work and Pensions or the, these departments will obviously have different names in different countries. But um, because the sen there are sensitivities around that sort of data and for some of that data, there isn't even a legal provision for the data to move from its source. So I think it may be the case that we'll need to keep those at least for some time um, or else access the data in another way, perhaps by some federated system so that they don't leave their location. But I think it's 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 a useful thing. But I think, yes, as long as the right controls are in place, it may not be such a necessity. But it is useful for places that don't have a safe room because really I suppose the safe room or the safe pod only really adds physical controls because uh, technical and procedural controls would still be in place you know policies data access agreement um, the inability to take data away let's say the firewall system really what it does is it's a room or a pod that someone is monitored when they go into so they can't take their bag in and pen and paper and the cctv in there and then anything they want to walk out with is also scrutinized so in a way they are just additional physical controls but they they seem to be providing some reassurance for some of the data I think, it, again, it might be a British thing with money, you know, because we don't talk about money. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that clarification. Uh, I do have another question here from our mm. audience. It seems like there are a lot of relationship building to use administrative data. Or there's a need for a lot of relationship building. Yes. Was there many in-person meetings to build trust with data custodians? And what were their responses with the research findings? Mm, yes, yes. Um, we, uh, as far as ADRC Wales is concerned, we work very closely with our Welsh government colleagues and they, well, they engage in projects themselves using the data. Um, we've had a relationship like that for quite a long time because we did that with SAIL anyway. But now, of course, we've been able to expand into other departments, other Welsh government departments as well. But there's also work on the UK scale, even up to the Cabinet Office level, in order to look at what sort of legislation is in place, what legislation would be needed if we really want to be able to expand uh, what is what can happen. Um, I think in general, things are improving. I think, you know, as, as I mentioned, really, because a lot of the work has been done with health, um, diverging into administrative data was initially a bit new, but with with sale, the first thing we did was we worked with um, education data. So even before we started working as part of the ADRN, we were working with the Welsh Government on education data. And that is one particular data set where the data provider 
retains the right to give their approval or not to any proposed research use. So some of the administrative data providers like to do that. They, rather than devolve that approval to uh, just an independent review panel, they say, well, we just reserve the right so that we can just check that any proposed research is in our interest. So we, we have you know, different levels of safeguards if people prefer that, if different data providers prefer that. And I think we can usually find a way forward. It's just it may need to be a different way forward in different cases, depending on the, the laws and the regulations around the particular data. Great, thank you. And maybe just one final question. Um, you talk about uh, a recommendation for researchers to maybe provide a do's and don'ts or tips for uh, sharing mm. experiences with other researchers about uh, their data access process or uh, how things worked in the in the full um, use of their data. Is that something that you're doing now, or do you have some ideas around what that would look like in the future? Mm. Um, I think we're only really doing that locally at the moment, and I would imagine the other ADRCs are doing the same. But I think that would be something that the partnership, so there is a, a coordinating hub, that would be something I could suggest to them that they could do that and they could collate these experiences and they could also collate a little group of case studies of this for this sort of research I did or I didn't need that approval, this consent or whatever. That's a good suggestion actually. I could I could suggest they they use their coordinating role to pull some information together on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent excellent ideas. Thank you. So I Oh, I don't see any further questions. And thank you again for, for the presentation today, Karina. Valu very valuable information for many, many individuals. And I know um, this will be an excellent resource when it's uh, up on our website for people to access. So thanks again for, for sharing your information, knowledge, and your time at this time in the morning. Oh, thank you very much, Anne. Thank you. Okay. Bye for now.